And our next speaker is Joseph Pellerin. A quiet and reserved researcher and practitioner, Joseph is considered by Cognizanti to be one of the pioneers and top experts on agile methods. Today, he will talk about data, not opinions, the psychometrics of team and organizational dynamics. Joseph, the stage is yours. Happy to be back at Stretch this year, although it wasn't planned. I've spoken here and at Craft a number of times. Most of the times it was planned, sometimes it was spontaneous and improvised. But last week I got a, an email from the feller asking if I could jump in on short notice to substitute for someone who had to cancel. So I said, of course, and asked if there was any special topic <clears throat> that he would like me to speak about. So he asked me if there was anything I was working on currently and said, oh, I saw this and I thought it was funny. That was this quote down here from Deming, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And then he wrote that maybe something about this topic could be interesting, about how leaders could be better <clears throat> at being data-driven on soft topics, on people topics, without them having to have a postgraduate degree in psychology. Oops. So this meant I couldn't talk the way I normally do, but I thought it would be a great topic for the talk and a great challenge for me. I mean, essentially, this is what evidence-based practice is trying to be, right? You try to justify things with statistics to people who hate statistics when you don't really understand them yourself, right? As you know, studies show that 90% of all people will believe anything you say as long as your first three words are studies show that. So in any case, this talk is really improvised. It's so new that the ink on my slides is still drying. So please be gentle with me in case uh, I forget something. It, the talk might be too short, the talk might be too long, uh, but I'll try to get it done in time, okay? <clears throat> so the current situation, the one I deal with, all right? As Peter Drucker once said, if you can't measure something, you don't know whether your actions, your investments, any interventions you make are improving it or not because it's easy to measure things like revenue, profit, ROI, but it's extremely difficult to measure anything that deals with people. How do you know that that training that you invested in or that consultant who wanted to improve your team and or your company's psychological safety or their performance, how do you know if they achieved that goal? And can you quantify by how much they did it? This is a challenge we have. So normally what you do is an assessment, right? The problem with assessments, Kozipski once said, the map is not the territory. The same goes for an assessment. An assessment says more about the person who designed it than about the person who takes it. If you remember, the map is not the territory. The map is a subjective representation of the territory that the map maker makes to emphasize what he or she thinks is important to you. The same goes for assessments. I remember once in a psychometrics class where our professor came in, handed out a bunch of business assessments, said, take a look at these and tell me what these people are trying to sell. This is the problem with assessments. And this is where psychometrics can help, okay? What is psychometrics? It's one of these big words that scares people. Psychometrics is a branch of psychology that deals with design of instruments to measure what we call a latent construct. A latent construct. So if I was there with you, I could probably directly measure your height or your weight if I had the proper instruments. What I couldn't directly measure would be your age, your IQ, your level of depression, things like that. So these properties, these attributes aren't directly observable and not directly measurable, okay? Which means that any measurement is only an estimate, okay? So psychometrics can help us improve our estimates in two different ways. It teaches us how to design questions and how to ask people the better questions and how to run better statistics on these questions, remembering that people are a bit special, 
when you ask them questions. And to be honest, psychometrics is what separates the real psychologists from the amateurs. This is how we flex our muscles. I can ask better questions than you, and I'll prove it with advanced statistics. So let me show you one thing that I'm working on and how I'm using psychometrics to help that. This is something called the team dynamics inventory. Okay, The model behind this is about high performing teams. Okay, <clears throat> And this is based on serious quantitative research that comes from MIT and from Carnegie Mellon. What their researchers, they went from the hypothesis that if you get a group of really smart people together, you have a really smart team. So individual intelligence will help with collective intelligence and that will help team performance. But if you see those numbers there, don't worry too much about what they are. It's just, they're between zero and one and they're quite low, okay? But what they discovered, <clears throat> what would really help make teams intelligent and high performance, ready to be surprised, psychological safety, the buzzword of the year, right? Allow me to go on a rant about this. Psychological safety has become an empty buzzword. And it's quite interesting thinking about and discussing it with a couple colleagues. It seems that the only people talking about psychological safety are not psychologists. And funny, we psychologists have more interesting things to talk about, but we don't have to prove that we're psychologists. Psychological safety is cool. You talk about it. And as one of my friends says, right, psychology has to deal with people. We're all people. So of course we're psychologists, even if our degree is from Google University, right? But we've all heard about this. Psychological safety, yes, it is necessary. It's a climate where people feel comfortable being themselves. That's the official definition from the book. I prefer to have another definition from a psychologist friend of mine. It's a psychologically safe space. It's like a dance floor where you can be yourself. And you think about that, going out on a dance floor if nobody's there, being the first one, trying to express yourself, how comfortable are you? Especially for somebody like me who has two left feet, two left legs, and one is shorter than the other, right? So that's a challenge. So as we all know, psychological safety is important, especially since Google found that out. But we maintain psychological safety is a necessary but not sufficient prerequisite for high-performing teams and organizations. Well, what else do we need? What the researchers at MIT discovered <clears throat> is we also need cognitive diversity. We need people who think differently. Now, there, this is another buzzword that's come up uh, strongly recently, diversity and inclusion. And we tend to believe that all types of diversity, be it gender diversity, be it ethnic diversity, be it religious diversity, be it sexual orientation diversity, all leads to one aspect is that people think differently. And what we need is this diversity of thought in order to be creative, to be innovative, and to be able to confront the challenges that we're currently facing. As Patton once said, if everyone's thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. The third thing we need, another buzzword, empathy. As Simon Baron Cohn says, empathy is the ability to identify what someone else is thinking or feeling and to respond to that person's thoughts and feelings with the appropriate emotion. This is also a buzzword. Once again, my LinkedIn feed this morning, I saw somebody posting this article on Forbes saying that empathy is the most important thing that leaders nowadays need. Yes, but whereas things like psychological safety, cognitive diversity, the more the better, empathy is not like that. Empathy is not a trait where more is better. Empathy is a bell curve. If you have no empathy, less empathy you have, the more people tend to drift into autism spectrum disorder, Asperger's, things like that, or psychopathy. 
The opposite is also true. The more empathy you have, the higher risk you have of getting higher hyper empathy syndrome, possibly borderline disorder and burnout. So remember, you have to balance that. So what I'm looking at is mapping teams, mapping organizations in a dry dimension, in a three-dimensional space of safety, diversity, and empathy. Now, based on other research from Reynolds and Lewis, they say that diversity and safety together, they lead to a higher quality interaction between groups of people. And they enable higher quality innovation, agility, responsiveness, and then higher performance. I maintain that if we add empathy to this, that will ease the interaction because of the increased understanding between people. It will ease the interaction between these individuals, the teams and the organizations, as well as it will ease the acceptance of novel, innovative ideas because, for example, of the lack of jealousy. Now, the interesting thing is that you need all three of these. Only having psychological safety, only having any two is not sufficient. Let's take a look. If we only have empathy and psychological safety, but no diversity of thinking, we're getting into user groups, group things. We all think the same way, we all understand each other, but we don't accept another group's opinions and way of thinking about things. If we have empathy and diversity, but no safety in speaking out what we think, things become frozen. Ideas are there, but they're never brought in and acted upon. Last but not least, if we have psychological safety and diversity, if we feel comfortable speaking and we have different ways of speaking from each other, but we have no empathy for each other, we end up where we are now with COVID debates. Okay. So if we go on and build on this, and Jim Dater said, any useful idea about the future should appear to be ridiculous. Of course, the opposite isn't true. And all ridiculous ideas are not going to be useful. Okay, but any useful idea about the future should appear to be ridiculous. And this is where we need all of these three. Have you ever experienced being in a group where we're looking for a solution to a problem, looking for ideas? Somebody brings in an innovative, a creative idea, and someone else says, shut up, that's stupid. That's happened, right? But the lack of psychological safety will damage any of these ideas. And the fear of sanction here, it's not about being disciplined for say, saying something that might be considered stupid, but it's about social sanctions. It's about the loss of esteem and respect in the group. It's about being embarrassed in front of others. And these are all things that we as people, as humans, we're attuned to and designed to avoid uh, if at all possible. How much social backlash would you suffer in your team and in your organization if you contributed a ridiculous idea? So how can we go about assessing these dynamics? There are two different ways. We can ask people or we can observe them. Now, since this talk is very short, I'm only going to go a bit into the part about asking, observation, running tests and games with people. That's part of another talk, unfortunately. But if we ask what we're going to look for, and this is a big challenge, is something that is quantifiable and something that is actionable, right? So the best approach and what I use is to combine the two of these into a mixed method, multi-model approach. Right now, let's just take a look at asking. What are we asking about? Also, what are we looking for? Our behaviors. Uh, Reynolds and Lewis define certain generative and non-generative behaviors. They say that high-performance teams, high-performance organizations, innovative, creative organizations, 
have behaviors, you notice people being curious, encouraging, resourceful, flexible, experimental, and appreciative. In organizations that aren't that way, you'll find behaviors of being hierarchical, people being conforming, cautious, resistant to change, a very controlling power, and being very directive. So what Reynolds and Lewis did was map safety and diversity into four quadrants. I personally think this is a good idea. I wish it wasn't stated as one of these two by two management matrices where lower left is bad and upper right is good. But in any case, they consider four different environments, right? Depending on the amount of diversity, the amount of safety. And they say that the generative environment is the one where teams and organizations score high on both aspects. Now using this, I can track the results of an intervention that I've done. I say I've taken a team that doesn't feel psychologically safe, but has cognitive diversity and starts moving them into a different space. And we can actually track this. We can quantify this. There is data behind this that we can actually see that this intervention over time has been successful. What we can also see from the same intervention before the intervention, the dominant behaviors that were reported were the non-generative ones, being hierarchical, being controlling, being cautious, et cetera. Moving over after the interventions, being encouraging, being flexible, as you see, there are still some non-generative behaviors there afterwards. We can't get rid of all of them, nor do we want to. That culture is part of what made the organization the way it is. And you don't want to remove everything of it, okay? So what I'd like to do at the end is show you a couple case studies. They're ongoing case studies. I'm not done with either of these but give you a feeling for some of the work that I'm doing and how I can do it with other companies. Company A, team dynamics inventory position. What I've done is I've taken Reynolds and Lewis's graph and expanded it to also show empathy. The larger the circle, more, the more empathy people see. The smaller the circle, the less empathy that they do. What we see here is that this organization feels relatively safe, have a good degree of cognitive diversity, but they're not quite there yet. So if we look at their behaviors, what we see is that it's a very encouraging environment. People are curious, they're appreciative, they're experimental, but on the other hand, they're cautious. Now this, I found these results interesting. I thought I'd go a bit deeper in them. And so as a result of the assessment, the testing I was doing, I was also testing people's uh, dispositional profiles, their personality traits using the uh, Neo FFI, actually the Neo PIR personality inventory. And what I came up with here were some interesting correlations between Oh, sorry, this is the big ugly table just to prove that I actually did the, the statistics. On the top here, we have the 12 different uh, behaviors. And on the left-hand side, we have the five different uh, personality traits. And this is a point by serial correlation coefficient. And I promise myself, I will not say any of these big terms without explaining to you what this stuff is. Okay, a point by serial correlation coefficient measures how good two attributes relate to each other when one of them is a continuous variable and the other one only has a specific set of values. For example, does a person's IQ in the United States have a direct relation to whether they vote Democratic or Republican? We have one. The IQ is a continuous variable. In a two-party system, we have dichotomous variables. 
But don't worry about this big stuff. Some people use these big terms just to bluff and just to show off. And if you're worried about that, do what my wife always does. If my wife sees a paper where I have some big words on this, she'll normally write something like Harry Potter and the port by serial correlation coefficient. Don't worry about it. Go on. So let's not go back to that table because that's too much. But what we can find here are some really interesting correlations. What I found is that people in this organization who ranked high in agreeableness, they wanted to be liked, they're friendly, they're helpful to other people, that they saw the behavior as being very encouraging. And for any of you who's ever done psychology and statistics, that R value of 0 0.816 is extremely high. And what's even more impressing is the P value of 0 0.004. Yes, got it. What we also see is that people who score high on agreeableness, they tend to be encouraged and they also tend to be resourceful. What's interesting is that people who are neurotic, score high on neuroticism, they find the environment to be conforming. But we also have an interesting negative correlation. People who are very conscientious, they don't find it to be conforming. Interesting. So what I thought I would do is start comparing how similar people were, okay? So what we see here is an interclass inter correlation co coefficient. Don't worry about that. That's Harry Potter and the interclass correlation coefficient. That's just a number that says how much do these people agree with each other. More interesting is this big graph on the right where the redder something is, the more two of the people agree with each other. If it's very light color, they're not very much in agreement. If it's very dark, then they're in total agreement. And what we see the diagonal is that everyone's in total agreement with the themselves, which is always a good thing. But what I noticed here was this big block. Now that's interesting. We have a chunk here, we have a cluster. So I thought, might there be a number of clusters? Can I take a look and see if there are any clicks forming here? So what I use is something that's called a scree plot. And the scree plot helps us figure out how many clusters there are. Okay, And it shows eigenvalues. Oh, that's another big word. Harry Potter and the eigenvalues. Harry Potter and the eigenvalues, that sounds like some rock group from the 1980s. Sorry about that. Don't worry about that. Scree plot's going to tell me that essentially we probably have two different clicks here. So if I do a factor analysis, a factor analysis is trying to crunch all these different ways of looking at things down and see, are there any commonalities here? What we discovered is that there are essentially two different groups of people. Now, knowing this company, it's a client of mine, and knowing the people there, you have to trust me, this makes total sense to me. These are really two different groups of people. Uh, what I did afterwards was then I went here, went back. If you see, I changed the heat map, changed the order of people in the heat map uh, to match the factor analysis. And what we see is that we do have two relatively big clusters that are in agreement with each other, the way they're viewing things, but not in agreement with the others. Now that's very interesting. We could use this information to say, would it make sense to put these people together in the team because they more work better together? So company B, another one of my clients. Now look at this one. Here we have people who feel very safe, but standard deviation, the spread over psychological safety is a lot bigger here than it is over cognitive diversity. You have a number of people who are very empathic, but we have that one little black dot in there of a person who doesn't really have much empathy. So if we look at their behaviors, <clears throat> we see that they're very flexible and resourceful. What's missing here, what I'm working on is appreciative and experimental. So essentially the people here feel they're not being appreciated for their work. It's okay, your work's done, good, let's do the next thing. 
And that's something that I've now fed back to management. Is there a way that you can show them your appreciation and experimental, let them try out new ways of working? Yeah. Now their co correlation heat map looks like this, okay? Also, their intraclass correlation coefficient is relatively low, but there are some clicks in here, right? We see one here and we see one here. Now this happens to be two separate teams, uh, but also what we did, I ran the scree plot, did the factor analysis, came up with two clusters that will cover most of the variance here, but also this Raider number five stuck out like a sore thumb, didn't fit in any place. So if we take a look here, what we see is that Raider number five doesn't really seem to fit in with anyone else. And that's quite interesting, but I went on and said, okay, who do you think this Raider number five is here? Raider number five is that person. What does this tell me about how I should structure my teams, how I should put them together in order to have them work very efficiently? How can I see that when I put them together in different ways and run these tests again, that I can actually quantify the change that's been done? This is important. If you hear anybody talking about team performance or high performance and stuff, ask them for the data. Ask them to quantify it and ask them to prove it. Okay, I'm almost done. I have one final quiz for you. Two companies, <clears throat> company A and company B. Which company do you think is a software company? Which company do you think is a consulting company? Hmm? Think about it. So just finishing up, once again, you have a right as a leader to demand the data, demand the proof, demand quantifiable evidence. Right? I'll leave you with this quote from Deming, in God we trust, all others bring data. Okay? So I just want to point out, there is also a lot of research done, a lot of support, you know, real serious scientific research, here are some papers on it, some more papers, some more papers, even more papers, more, 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 more. Here's a couple more and even some more. There's a lot of work that's been done on this really seriously. Okay, if you want to find out more about this, about the work that I do and how I do it with uh, organizations and teams, feel free to look me up on LinkedIn. If you look me up on LinkedIn, please just write me a little note saying, hey, I heard your talk, I'd like to connect with you, or go to my website and you can connect with me then there. Okay, thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I certainly enjoyed it. And thank you for showing us all your references. Um, I'm sure a lot of us can start digging in the topic. Um, I can see that our audience is still pondering some questions. So I would like to first start by asking which metric was the consulting company? Consulting company was, uh, was company A. Okay. <clears throat> and the software company was company B. So the uh, consulting company had the narrower bandwidth, narrower standard deviation of psychological safety, but the larger bandwidth of diversity. The software company had the higher bandwidth of psychological safety. There were people who felt safe. There were people who didn't feel so safe. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. As our audience is uh, preparing, oh, here uh, is a question already from Anna. Can you share with us some examples on what do you do in these interventions that you've mentioned previously? Mm -hmm. um, once again, the, right, the problem with assessments 
<coughs> is that, <coughs> pardon me, they are normally designed by people or companies who have something to sell. An agile assessment or a scrum assessment is sold by a company that's one to sell their agile consulting or their scrum consulting or things like that. Uh, I consider myself as a researcher um, to be a doctor. If you go to your doctor, right, you, you know the quote about Maslow's hammer. If all you have is a hammer, every problem is a nail. There are a lot of interventions that you can do here. And what I'm actually looking for and what I find to be quite useful here is that this theory that I have tends to be more inclusive. If uh, we didn't even get to talk about the other analysis that, that we do with the observations and stuff, but we can do that at a very micro level. Um, but yeah, you can do work on increasing psychological safety you can do work on increasing diversity. Actually, company A <clears throat> found out that their way of increasing diversity would be to start looking for more diverse clients. Looking for more diverse clients would indirectly cause, bring them to attract more diverse workforce. Or also training in empathy and emotional intelligence. There are a lot of interventions that, that are possible there. And I am not selling one particular intervention. And when I work with clients, if I find out that there's an intervention that's necessary that I don't do, I will bring in other specialists, just the way your doctor does. This is the only way of being a professional is to know the bounds of your professional competency. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, here is the next question that Oro also has gotten some upwards from Chaba. How could we get a sample of those magic questions you use for gathering the data? Okay, this is my research. This is my proprietary IP, right? Uh, if you are a psychologist and you've studied this stuff, if you study cognitive psychology and psychometrics, you should be able to figure this out for yourself. Um, but part of this is part of my consulting offering. Yeah. So get if, in touch with Joseph and you will get the uh, sample. Uh, another, <clears throat> another suggestion, if you're really interested in this, I'm doing a half day workshop at the end of January with the psychologist colleague uh, at Jutta Eckstein's conference, the OOP in Munich where we're going to go into detail and show maybe some of the questions we're going to show the exercises we do for the other part of the assessment. Um, and you can learn how to do at least a good bit of it there. Thank you. Thank you. What an awesome opportunity. Thank you for, for letting us know that. And uh, by the way, uh, yeah. uh, I have to convince you, I might also be able to do it at craft this year if it's going to be live. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. We are looking forward to that. I, I hope that a lot of things are going to be live yeah. Um, yeah. this coming year. Joseph, thank you so much for joining us at Stretch 2021. I am showing you our gift of appreciation. Thank you yeah. for uh, being one of our speakers. We will be sending you this after the event has taken place. Um, and um, as you said, I hope uh, some of our audience will be able to get in touch with you via LinkedIn. Yeah. Thank you so much okay. for coming. Okay, thanks a lot. After I get out of Zoom, I'm going to try to log in to hop in if anybody wants to chat there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Have a nice awesome. day. Bye-bye.